Hi, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri appellate attorney and a guy who likes to make the, the law make sense on YouTube. Let's talk about the United States court system, both federal and state. Stay tuned. Here in a moment, I'm going to put up some slides that detail the uh, organization and structure of the United States courts, both the federal courts and the state courts. So I don't mean to be uh, rude by popping back and forth between the slides and uh, my face here, but basically what we're doing is we're uh, trying to illustrate, and it, it really helps to have some visual aids to sort of capture all of this. So let's start, first of all, with the overall structure. You have the United States Supreme Court at the top because the Supreme Court is the final arbiter of questions regarding the United States Constitution. Now, if there is a final question or a question about the, uh, the law of the state, that's the state Supreme Court, and we'll get to that. But federal questions and federal constitutional questions are the province of the United States Supreme Court. Below the United States Supreme Court, however, we have the Circuit Courts of Appeal. The U.S. Circuit Courts of Appeal, there are 11 of them plus the Federal Circuit, are designed to cover varieties of states. For example, the Eighth Circuit has Minnesota and uh, Iowa and Missouri and Arkansas. Below these Circuit Courts of Appeal, however, we have the United States District Courts. The U.S. District Courts try criminal and civil cases in their jurisdiction. Civil cases, however, they have a restricted jurisdiction. In other words, the only cases that they can try are ones specifically granted to them by Congress, and that is federal diversity cases, which are cases between citizens of different states, uh, and then cases that arise under federal law. So if you had a question about a copyright issue, it would go into federal court. Whereas if you had a, a question uh, regarding a contract and it was the citizens of the same state, that would have to go into state court. You wouldn't have federal jurisdiction for that. But that's what the district courts do. They try civil and uh, criminal cases in their state. So example, for example, the district courts in Missouri, there is an Eastern Division, which is the St. Louis Division, and a Western Division, which is the Kansas City Division. And then the Kansas City Division has a Central Division, which includes Jefferson City, and a Southern Division, which includes Springfield. And of course, the Eastern District has divisions in Hannibal and down in Cape Girardeau. So that's how the state is covered with regard to uh, district courts. In your state, you will probably find there is a very similar distribution of the federal courts in your state. And then there is a special branch of courts called the bankruptcy courts. And we'll talk about how they're appointed here in a moment. But the bankruptcy courts try only bankruptcy cases or cases that arise under the bankruptcy statutes or that relate to bankruptcy cases. So, for example, if uh, Company A sues Company B, and in the process of going through the case, Company B declares bankruptcy, all of a sudden that case between Company A and Company B that would have been tried in the state court of Minnesota now winds up being tried in the bankruptcy courts in Minnesota if that's where Company B is headquartered. So, um, the bankruptcy court jurisdiction is uh, very difficult to understand, and it's uh, just almost a law school class in and of itself. But that's how that system works. Now let's look about at the difference between Article III and Article II courts. In this slide, you will see that the United States Supreme Court, the United States Circuit Courts of Appeal, and the U.S. District Courts are what we call Article III courts. Article III courts are provided for specifically in the Constitution, and their jurisdiction is uh, only the, I guess, only the United States Supreme Court has its jurisdiction outlined in the Constitution. The United States Circuit Courts of Appeal and the United States District Courts, their jurisdiction is provided by Congress. And there are several statutes directly on point that 
outline when the district courts and the circuit courts of appeal have some kind of jurisdiction. This is Article 3, Section 1. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall, at stated times, receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. This is a section of the Constitution which provides for life tenure and for the jurisdiction of the federal courts and the federal system. And then you'll see those are blocked off as Article III courts on this, and then you have the bankruptcy courts, which are Article II courts. What do we mean by Article II courts? They arise under the legislative branch, and they are not Article III courts, and the judges in bankruptcy courts do not have Article III powers. That does not mean, however, that they cannot effect uh, cases under that arise under Article III or that or would normally be tried in Article III courts. They are considered to be a division of the district court in their state, but their judges are not appointed the way federal district court judges are. Let's look at how the federal district court judges and the circuit court of appeal judges are appointed. As mentioned earlier, the United States Supreme Court is the, pres the judges are nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. And the same thing applies in the United States Circuit Court of Appeals, but the judges have to come from within the circuit. So, for example, uh, if the Seventh Circuit has a vacancy on the Circuit Court of Appeals, then those judges can only come from the Seventh Circuit. And then the district courts, those judges are also nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. But the process is actually a little different than that. The home state senators of the state where the vacancy exists go to the president and say, we recommend you appoint Mr. A and Mr. B. Now, the president doesn't have to abide by that. He can certainly appoint somebody else, someone of his choosing, if he wants to. However, when that happens, normally what happens is the senators who are offended by that will blue slip the, the judge's nomination and it will sort of go into a senatorial limbo and he'll never get confirmed. So if the judge actually wants to get somebody appointed, he needs to negotiate with those senators and get somebody that everybody can agree on. I've seen a lot of people criticize this process, but I have to tell you, I am pretty much a conservative, although I work in a plaintiff's law firm, I am pretty much conservative. And it is always better to have a very close mix of conservatives and liberals on a circuit court of appeals and within a district court. And the reason I say that is because when you have a mix of ideologies, then what happens is tough issues get discussed and they get viewed through different lenses. And usually as a result of that, the decision that comes out is better in the long run, even if at that time you may not always agree with it. Let's move on to federal magistrates. Federal magistrates are judges who assist the United States District Court judges in their duties. For example, in a criminal case, they are probably going to handle the first appearance. They're going to set bail if bail is allowed and they are going to set the terms of bail release. In other words, if they have to wear an ankle monitor, that sort of thing. They handle a lot of pretrial motions in the civil courts. So, for example, if you have a motion to compel discovery, where you need to get something from the plaintiff, or the plaintiff needs to get something from the defendant, the magistrate judge will frequently handle that. How are these judges appointed? Well, they're appointed by the district court judges. Usually they solicit applications from the bar in the state where the magistrate is going to be replaced. And then those judges get together and decide, and by, and by majority vote, decide who to appoint. They're appointed for eight-year terms, and they can be reappointed. So how are bankruptcy judges appointed? 
Well, the statutes provide that a bankruptcy judge is appointed by the circuit court judges in that circuit. So, for example, in Missouri, the bankruptcy court judges in the St. Louis Bankruptcy Court are appointed by the Eighth Circuit judges. And in Illinois, in Chicago, the bankruptcy judge would be appointed by the Seventh Circuit Circuit judges. So where do the appeals go from all of these different courts? Let's look at that. And let's start at the lowest of these courts, which is the bankruptcy court. The bankruptcy court appeal goes to the uh, appellate panel, the bankruptcy appellate panel, if one is established. Not every circuit has one. And if it doesn't have one, like Delaware, then what will happen is it will go to the district court of that district. The district court will render its decision, and then if there is um, disagreement about the outcome, it would be handled in the same way that an appeal from the district court would be. And again, both criminal and civil trials occur at the district court level, and people are frequently dissatisfied. Usually at least one party is dissatisfied by the result, and they have a right to appeal, and that appeal goes up to the Circuit Court of Appeals. And if somebody believes that the Circuit Court of Appeals got it wrong, then they can file what's called a writ of certiorari, which goes to the United States Supreme Court. So, that's how the appeals work in the Federal Circuit. Now, let's go back to this first slide and talk about how things work in state courts. In Missouri, we have circuit courts, and every, uh, every county has a circuit court. Above that, they have an intermediate court of appeals, and that intermediate court of appeals in Missouri is either the Eastern District or the Western District or the Southern District Court of Appeals. Then it goes from in the state court system to the state Supreme Court. Now, the state Supreme Court may very well hear a U.S. constitutional challenge. For example, in a criminal case, the idea that somebody did not get a fair trial, that they were denied their right to counsel, or they were denied their uh, right to uh, effective representation. Those kinds of constitutional issues are reviewed by the state Supreme Court. But if there is a live constitutional issue at the state Supreme Court, there is a right to take that federal constitutional issue up to the United States Supreme Court. In Missouri, there is a provision that says the courts shall, be, shall remain open at all times, effectively saying that there should never be a case where there is a right without a remedy. And frequently, that is, there are issues that come up that sound under that state constitutional provision. When those go up to the state Supreme Court, those are decided under state law, and even if you object to the way it's handled by the state Supreme Court, because it is a state constitutional provision, you don't get to take it up to the United States Supreme Court unless it also violates a federal constitutional question and you have preserved that issue. So that's an overview of the state's and federal court system. I'm sure I could go into more depth if I had more than 15 minutes, but then again, you probably don't have that much no-dose to keep you awake. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you found it useful. And to the person who requested that I do the video, I hope that it meets your needs. If it doesn't, please let me know. I can answer any questions that you have. Again, thank you for watching. Have a marvelous day.